Hi puzzles and pieces! This is Jessica from Multiplicity and Me bringing you the lived experience of DID. Today I'll be running you through some of the advice and guidance of what to do if you feel that you may have something like DID. This will be based on my own personal experiences of mental health care in the UK, plus a little bit of sprinkle of some of the knowledge that I've gained from working within the mental health field and professional services. Just basically a little bit more about how the system works. I'll try and lay this out so we have a clear overview of the steps plus an overview at the end. Very briefly, the first thing I wanna do is go through my own experiences and my own journey so you guys can sort of see what I did and how I ended up where I am. I think I had my, oh heck, I might have DID moment now about 15 years ago. So I'm 30 now, I was 15 then. So yeah, 15 years. I remember this because I was in my school uniform. So I was clicking away at some Wikipedia links. One thing led me to another and I came across an article that said, you know, this is all about schizophrenia. It's not to be confused with dissociative identity disorder. And I was really interested, so I clicked it. And suddenly it was like my whole life suddenly made sense. That's that feeling. It was just like, whoomph. Wow, I've never related to anything to describe my experiences so well in my life. I was really heartbroken, but equally really intrigued, like hopeful that I could now start making sense of my world. I saw my GP, went to a psychiatrist, and I did all the things I was supposed to do on the NHS, but was kind of left without nothing. Um, and I just kind of tried to go on my merry way all those years later. And eventually, reached out to a specialist centre after prompts from my psychology professors at the time, um, basically in order to get me a little bit more support at university because my results and stuff were all over the place and they had a pretty good understanding or a pretty strong inclination that dissociation was what I was suffering from. I didn't go to seek a DID diagnosis and I think that's something that's really important to bear in mind. I went seeking answers, I wanted answers. I didn't care what the answer was, I just wanted help, I just wanted support to make sense of what was going on for me. And I felt like that field fitted more boxes than anything else I'd looked at or known about so far. So at least if it wasn't what I thought it was, they could hopefully pinpoint me in the right direction. So I went in very open-minded. There were no social media channels back in the day, or pretty much none. Um, so I didn't really, I wasn't able to relate my experiences to many other people in real life. It was just all about what I could read about. Which is kind of why, as you guys know, why I started this channel in the first place. It was to kind of put my experiences out there, get the conversation going and say, hey, DID is not like it is in films. So social media really is the biggest change between then and now, like then being at 19 when I first got my diagnosis and now 11 years later. So my advice is as follows. My first one is to be honest with yourself. I think it's really important to reflect and ask ourselves some questions first. So the first thing is, why do you feel that you may have this? Like, what was the source? Was the source reliable? What made you feel that you could relate so strongly? So maybe it's worthwhile to start asking yourself some of those questions first and foremost. Self-reflection, openness and honesty, I think are definitely some real key factors to have from the start to beyond the end of your journey, really, if you're going kind of down the, the treatment route. Bear in mind that people online may believe or say they have something when perhaps actually they are misguided, or they may have something, but then accidentally deliver misinformation. So whenever you read or see something online, don't forget to take that with a pinch of salt. It's really, really important that we can stay objective. And this is of course, including us. So obviously if we say something, do your own research, make sure we haven't got the wrong end of the stick. And that isn't to poo on other people talking about their experiences. The whole point in me starting this channel was to get that kind of ball rolling. And I'm so proud and pleased people are doing that. But there's nothing wrong, I guess, with recognising that transference and counter-transference that may be going on when you're influenced by something online. Yes, it may be exactly that. The person may have 100% right and you may also too or there could be some things that aren't quite right. And it's, that's why I think it's so important for us to remain objective. So my advice with that as well is to make sure that you're looking at things from an out of, out of box perspective as much as possible, which then kind of goes on to the hot topic of self-diagnosis. So I am gonna give my two cents here and I hope, I mean, and, and 
and this really does come from the best intended place. So don't get caught up in self-diagnosing. Um, if you suspect that you have something, there's nothing wrong with saying exactly that suspected or potential rather than categorically self-diagnose. We could be wrong or we could force ourselves into labels and symptoms that actually don't define us and don't fit as well. A little bit like fitting a square peg into a round hole. By definitively stating we have a self-diagnosis kind of takes away our openness in what our symptoms could mean as there is so many crossovers of symptoms of DID, not only with other conditions, but basically with normal mental health, um, you know, you can dissociate to a normal degree, you can daydream to a normal degree. It's also a symptom to have a little bit of identity confusion and alteration. And that's so normal, especially after a big life event, such as moving out from home or leaving our partner, or even just being a teenager, going through that whole process, it can be a very confusing time. So it's just all things to bear in mind, I guess, as we consider whether or not we should maybe say, oh, I'm self-diagnosed or just saying I could potentially have DID or saying I, I feel I have suspected DID. There's nothing wrong with saying things like that, but my personal perspective is that self-diagnosis can sometimes hinder rather than help. It's perfectly acceptable to relate to DID, whether in part or in its entirety, and not have an official label, especially in the UK. No, I've lost my spot. Where do I scroll? Where did I, what was I gonna say? That was so important. Especially in the UK where access to private centers is expensive. And the NHS quite frankly seems to be moving away from diagnosing and focusing more on symptomology. Like the meaning behind those symptoms, why are you experiencing those symptoms? What can we do to support and help and treat those symptoms rather than officially putting a rubber stamp on it? Which again, both has pros and cons, I think, but it can be really irritating as when we're seeking a diagnosis, it's often for a reason, whether that's validation or for something official. So for me, like I said, without university prompting me and saying, hey, we need this in order to support you. I doubt I actually probably would have thought about seeking the diagnostic path because the diagnostic process actually really frightened me at the time. I was a little bit worried about what that would mean for me, how that would impact my life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so yeah, it's just interesting. So the NHS may be moving away from diagnoses, but actually sometimes we need them um, in order to do certain things. So sometimes a private diagnosis is all we can look for. So number three is research. So at this stage, I'm sure you already have done a little bit of research. And there's nothing wrong with that, but my advice again would be to not dig too deep as this could create further complications, further confusion. It's human nature for us to discover more. So I'm not gonna sit here and say, oh, don't research it, don't Google it, because of course we're going to, that's that's normal. And that's exactly what I did too. But we have to be careful that we are looking into things objectively and without as much influence as possible. We don't wanna frighten ourselves or feel that we absolutely have to categorically have every single symptom to every single degree because that's just not the case. It's crucial that we then don't conform to how maybe you've seen or read about other things online exactly as they are because that's then disingenuous. We don't have to feel that we must have that symptom somehow, somewhere. We need to be honest with ourselves and reflective and it's okay to not fit into a diagnostic box because that's essentially what the DSM is built on. It's built on kind of putting people into boxes. So make sure that you're checking in and really reflecting on what experiences and symptoms you're having and not what others are having. So the, at this stage, there are two options, go private or get help via the NHS. Private may be a little bit shorter to talk about here. So I think I'll start with that first. Um, it's quicker and easier basically to get the answers that you need if you go down the private route, including assessment and treatment options. But of course this route is expensive. There are only three clinics for trauma and dissociation in the country as far as I'm aware. There may be more, don't hold me to that, but those are the three that I'm aware of. And the waiting list for these is ever increasing. Um, with again, the more awareness that's being generated, the more these places are building up. If you live in close proximity to any of these places, there is a very small chance that you may actually get funding via the NHS to access these services. But that honestly may take years depending on which clinic you're looking to apply for. My first step is to go away and have a little look at these websites and check actually they're everything that you're looking for. I think there's often an unclear grey area essentially of 
how much knowledge, experiences and titles someone needs to have in order to give you an official diagnosis. But the suggestion is often that you need a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist to make that happen. So some clinics recommend different titles at different pay rates. So there are some options, you know, like how many parties you want involved and how many checks you want doing. For example, you may be able to present a specialist psychotherapist verdict to the NHS and that could be accepted depending on who you see and where you are. But then it may not be accepted and you may need to have that clinical psychologist or psychiatrist instead. It really is a grey area. So if you want certainty that these diagnostic papers that you've paid for are have some weight behind them, then that may be something worth thinking about too. As a little helpful hand, I know that the Pottergate give out free screening tests to see if pursuing a DID or dissociative disorder diagnosis may be worth your while. I'm unsure if other clinics do this, um, but you could always go via this route and then this could potentially support your case uh, to a GP. So you could say, hey, I filled in these papers from the specialist centre, this was the result. It strongly indicates that I may have a dissociative disorder can you point me in the right direction of where I should go next? So if you've totally ruled out the private path or you'd like to try the NHS, unless you have access to a mental health worker already, the likely starting point is to contact your doctor's surgery. However, it's always worthwhile asking the receptionist if you can speak to someone in regards to your mental health as there may be other people besides the GP that you can see. There may be mental health nurses there, counsellors or people like me that will be able to see you um, that sometimes you don't know about that are available at your surgery. So just more of an info. Once your appointment is made, it may be worthwhile kind of preempting it and writing down exactly what symptoms you have, how they affect you and what outcome you're looking for. I think those are kind of the three main points I would highlight in any letter that you write. Be as clear as you can because if we assume that you're talking to your doctor that gives us what 10 minutes in, in the room. It may be worthwhile sending an email or a letter to the surgery in advance or taking this to your appointment with you so you're clear and concise. Again we're sticking with our point of being open, honest and self-reflective and being sure that what we're saying is true to us and not necessarily what we've read or watched online. We may say something like I feel I may be suffering with trauma dissociation because I'm experiencing xyz symptoms that affect me in xyz way and perhaps then giving the doctor one or two examples so it just makes it a little bit clearer and then close with kind of what you'd like next so it could be something as simple as i would like to be referred for an assessment to discuss my mental health when you're assessed you may be able to meet that someone who could potentially diagnose you again depending on who you're referred to and what area you're in or if that's simply not available you can just go in and ask for trauma therapy and again i i think that the nhs has moved away a lot from diagnoses and these are just just my thoughts i think it has it has to do with kind of like the triangle for the men mental health services. You know, you've got the psychiatrists that kind of sit right at the top. There's less of them, less of them to go around. And they're generally the people who do diagnose. And then you kind of see everybody else below before you work your way up. So I think, again, this is why the NHS is kind of moving away from necessarily labels and it's just focusing on treatment. Like, hey, if dissociation is bothering you, if traumas bother you, let's just focus on that. And then do you really need a diagnosis if your symptoms have presented in that way. If you're getting support and help for trauma and dissociation, do you necessarily need a diagnosis? And those, again, you may do, but it's just questions to kind of ask yourself and think about. But 15 years ago, when I started reaching out for help, there just seemed to be a barrier in getting services to understand. But later, I think the key was to ask my GP for trauma therapy. That kind of unlocked a whole new area for me to go in. I think there was a lot of confusion. Was I asking for a personality thing? Was I asking for what, you know? So when I was kind of clear and actually that that's what I need right now because my trauma is severely impacting me, that's where I was sent. And I was seen quite quickly actually, which was such a blessing in disguise. I did some one-to-one -one work first and foremost, and then moved to do group therapy, which sounds appalling, but I absolutely, it was actually amazing. I was so critical of it, but that group, I felt was more beneficial than the one-to-one -one therapy I initially received. So yeah, don't be afraid of what they offer you essentially. The group that I had, and I know this is kind of where it's at as well, is that with um, trauma therapy, you need to do safety and stabilization work first. So that means that if you do go further into depth with trauma, you'd like to unpack or discuss your trauma, you're not going to destabilize. So this is for anyone who has sort of trauma that they feel that they need to get off their chest that's what tends to happen in those services. So you, you have to receive 
that safety and stabilization before you can proceed. With that kind of therapy, the safety and stabilization therapy, the step one of trauma treatment uh, is essentially the ability to be resilient when you're thinking about, talking about, or experiencing symptoms of your trauma, and also ways to ground and distract and to stop the trauma essentially taking over as much of your life as it has been. I'd like to think that services are now much better than they were many years ago when I first tried to get help and support. Um, but again, I am very aware it depends on who you see, what they know, where you go, where you get referred, what happens next. There's so much involved in that. But I hope my advice has been able to help or at least clarify some points and um, how you can potentially follow the steps to get a diagnosis. What may happen as well is that if you do go through, like I sort of did with the one-to-one -one and the group therapy, um, I already had a diagnosis at this point through a private sector, so it didn't matter. But um, if I needed a diagnosis from there, the people working with me would likely be able to facilitate that if that was necessarily needed. So sometimes it is a case of you start the treatment before you start the diagnostic process, at least from my experiences um, on the NHS as a patient. So just an FYI, you're almost kind of working your way up that ladder, so to speak. Anyway, I hope this has been very helpful for you guys. The first thing is to be honest with yourself and be self-reflective. Second thing is try not to self-diagnose. We may be able to relate to, feel that we have suspected or potential. And that would be great to kind of see, I think, like um, for just from a perspective online, if you're racing down that I am definitely have DID route, much like I did, um, I think it's always worthwhile saying that you know it's potentially this or suspected that just so you're not kind of closing the door to other possibilities if they were to crop up even if you never decide to seek other support from elsewhere things could change research but not too deeply don't go down the rabbit hole so seek help either privately or via the nhs and a hint would be to write a letter in advance stating what you feel is going on why you feel it's going on and how it's affecting you and what you would like as a result of talking to that person today. Finally, there's a lot of pros and cons, of course, to a diagnosis, and those are kind of some things to bear in mind and think about. But if you are fearful of accessing trauma treatment, it's just to be mindful that the person that you're working with should work with you, not against you. They can't force you to do anything, and it's very important to be as open with them as possible to make sure that you can put your boundaries in place as well as theirs. If you didn't want to talk about that right now, the likelihood is, like I said, anyway, you'd be sent for safety and stabilization work and then you'd be able to talk about it in a one-to-one -one setting if you felt that was appropriate. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, whether or not you have DID, each part of you deserves self-love, self-care and compassion. Have a lovely rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Um... Hi, baby. Ha <laughs> <laughs>